Last week I told you that I was going to share with you how God wants to give you the desires of your heart. And I just said that straight out. I said, I'm going to share with you how that works. And I actually had some people this week say to me, you know, how can you justify saying that, that God wants to give us the desires of our heart? And I just want to tell you, it actually says it in the scripture more than once. But in Psalms uh, 37 verse 4, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's pretty straightforward. Read that with me. Would you read that out loud with me? Here we go. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's pretty straightforward. You can study that upside down, inside out, left and right, and you'll find that it doesn't mean anything other than what it says. If you delight yourself, got to figure out what that means, and the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now today, we're going to look at a tool that God gives us that enables us to delight in the Lord. How do you do that anyway? That's another whole subject, how to delight in the Lord. We'll get there. Today, we're going to look at a major tool. If you were a mechanic and you didn't have the, the main tool that you used, you'd be in trouble. If you're a, a carpenter, you didn't have the main tool, the hammer, you'd be in trouble. God gave us a tool. It is a, it is a key. It is a main thing. And if we don't get it right, we don't understand who God is. And we really can't delight ourselves in Him. We can't even really know Him. So we're going to look at that today. This tool can change everything. It can change everything. And I can't, I'm not exaggerating that or embellishing that. It can change everything. It can change you. It can change your past. It can change how you view your past. You know, that's a big deal, how you view your past. Some people walk in shame and in embarrassment and regret. This tool can change how you view your past, how you perceive it. And suddenly you can understand it and learn from it and, and it makes sense to you. This tool can help you navigate today, the present. That's huge. This tool can orchestrate the future so that you don't have to worry and stress as many of us do about the future. Today we're going to look at, you saw the video, the incredible power of persistent prayer. The incredible power of of persistent prayer. Not occasional prayer, not in trouble prayer. Sometimes those work. I'm going to tell you, I've been in trouble and I pray them. God has helped me many times. But I'm talking about the incredible power of persistent prayer. Prayer has power. Prayer has power. Many of you could stand up today and tell a story about how much power prayer has, what it's done. Many of you would like to hear that. We're going to get a chance today to hear somebody tell us what power, somebody besides me speaking and telling you what power of prayer that has and what it's done in their life. Prayer changes you. It rearranges you. Have you ever been out of sorts? You ever needed, your life was just kind of out of sorts and you need somebody to come in and kind of rearrange it in a right way? I'm telling you, man, from, from, from junior high school, elementary school, up to seniors, adults, prayer, when you pray, it, it isn't like, I'm kind of young, you know, I'm kind of stuck in junior high, I don't know, I'm kind of stuck because I'm a kid right now. What are you talking, I'm a kid. I'm old, I've already lived life, and everything in between, God can rearrange it the moment you start praying. I, I think of it like this, God can reboot you. You ever had your computer just quit on you? It just, you just quit, you just quit. You don't know why. You don't know, you, you, maybe you went and played the lottery too much or whatever, but it's got stuff in there and it quit. And you, know, you, you read, you, go, you, you can't go online to figure out what's wrong with it because it won't work. So you call you, just reboot the thing. That's what they used to do a lot. Now, not as much, but reboot it. So you just shut it off and it would reboot. And isn't it awesome how often that would just fix it? I'm telling you, that's what prayer is. It's a reboot. You can start from where you're at, in the middle of the confusion, all the mess, Frustration, hurt, anger, desperation. And you can pray, and it reboots you. You get to start again, start fresh. It's amazing. I, I just, if I could tell you stories about how I was in the middle of making a fool of myself as a young married person, and my wife just shaking her head at me, what's wrong with him? Because something was wrong with me. And I, and I just kept digging myself into this sad hole Anyone watching, I've, I've now, though, anyone watching, like if it was a movie and it was being filmed, they would just say, what is wrong with him? <laughs> and I would leave that room and go into another room, and I would get on my knees, and God, please help me. I'm an idiot. 
And I'm telling you, God would help me. He would give me the words to go out and, and know how to apologize right, know how to make restoration. I, the idiot fool, could restore the situation because I learned the power of prayer, persistent prayer. It was amazing. I still find it amazing. It rearranges you. It reboots you. When you pray, when you spend time and focus and energy speaking to God, you aren't just throwing words out into the air. You're not just passing time. It's meditation. One guy said, you know, I pray. I don't really pray to God or anything. It's kind of think thoughts. That's not prayer. It's not. I mean, I don't want to diss the guy or anything, but it's not. Prayer is, is, is communication with our Heavenly Father. Prayer changes you. And when you take time and your energy and your effort to speak to God, you aren't just throwing words in the air. You're not just filling time. When you pray, listen, when you pray, you are, you are living your belief. You are. You're living your belief. Like, you know, they taught us about prayer and everything. I just don't know. When you pray, even if you're uncomfortable with it, you're new at it, you don't know how to handle it, you are actually practicing. You're living your belief. Your belief in God. When you pray, you're showing where your faith is. You're showing where you put your confidence. Come on now. We put our confidence in a lot of stuff. How many of you, can I just ask, how many of you want to have a real life question? I mean, a real issue. You've actually gone to Google and Google it. Can I see your hands? If you, I, come, don't lie to me. Put your hands. I have done that. You know, I have done it. It's like, oh, Google. I got stuff going. Listen, and here's the thing, and I understand. There's some really wise people. There are some good people putting stuff in there, out there, in the air, on the internet. And sometimes you can find some of it. Listen, when you pray, you're showing where your confidence is in who you're putting your confidence in. <laughs> and you're putting it in God. And you're doing it in such a way that's unmistakable. You're putting your faith in the fact that God exists you ever wanted to show, how do I show my faith? You pray to God. You're showing yourself and anyone, anyone who knows you're praying that God, you believe God exists. And that you, not only that, you believe he hears you according to his word he does. So you're not, you're putting your faith in his word and you're, you're putting your confidence in him, your faith in him. And you know, that's why God called Abraham a, a friend is because Abraham believed God was there. It wasn't that he was, these people of old, these biblical guys we look at, they were not all that special. They just believed God was real. David, King David, a kid, a kid, the youngest of the brothers out in the fields hanging with sheep. He was in the fields with sheep because he was the youngest and that was all he was good for. Because you didn't have to be real smart when you were sheep because sheep weren't smart at all. And David believed God was real. So he, he talked to God and he wrote songs to God. And God enabled him to kill large animals because he believed God was real. This is what prayer is. And when you pray to God, you're making a statement to God and to the angels and to the entire world that you believe God exists. I believe God is real. I believe He exists and that God has power and that God listens to you and that God is faithful. That's, you're making that statement every time you pray to God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Bigger than you think. You're announcing I believe in God. Prayer is powerful. And God wants us to pray. He really does want to, he just want, he wants us to ask of him. That's a part of prayer, is asking of God. As a matter of fact, he gives us a scripture. It's in the last part of James uh, 4, verse 2. It says, you do not ask. It's a dialogue that goes in there about how people live and how messed up things get. But he, at the very end of a verse, he says, you don't have because you don't ask. Simply speaking, you don't have a lot of times because you just don't ask. God wants us to ask. Now here's something that may surprise you. Did you know that you can actually change God's mind with your prayers? Now I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. You can pray, you can change God's mind, God's mind with your prayer. By your request, you can actually change what God had planned to do. You may not, that's, that, it's a, that's a big deal. God, the creator of all things, all wisdom, all love, all perfection, and you can change his mind based on your request. That's huge. Moses did it. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Hezekiah, king, really cool king. You know, he's a great guy. Hezekiah did it. Joshua did it. 
Anybody heard of James Dobson? Can I see you? James Dobson? Anybody who that is? Just a few of you. I'll tell you about him in a minute. His, his grandfather did it. I'll tell you about that. My wife, I know that my wife got, changed God's mind with a prayer that she prayed. It's very specific, powerful thing. She's going to tell you about that in just a second. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not kidding. Your prayers can change God's mind about you and about your future and the people around you. In Exodus 32, Moses, this great guy of God, this great man who heard God and listened to God, and he, and he, and he and God loved Moses because Moses believed, you know, everybody else acted like, yeah, we believe, but they didn't act like they believed, you know, they didn't live their lives like, they didn't make their plans, they didn't act like they believed, Moses acted like he believed, this is what made him so special to God, you believe, and Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. You read the story, it's very interesting. He got up and down a few times. He's up there getting the Ten Commandments. And he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and, and he's, he's talking to God, and God's writing the commandments, and God just says to him, Moses, Moses, something's going on down in the valley. Something's going on down there. Your people, Moses, your people, the people that we delivered you, I delivered from Egypt, from the crazy people, the, the, the people that I parted the, the sea for and they went across it, and what a miracle, the people that I let manna come from heaven and feed them, the people that I did miracles for, the people that saw my power, those people, those people are down there right now melting their jewelry and making a golden cow and they're doing the jig in front of this cow. And they're worshiping the cow. Moses, you're, you're stupid. He didn't say stupid. He said stiff-necked. I think that means stupid. That you're, th those people are a stiff-necked, stubborn people, and they're down there. And Moses, I'm done with them. I have loved them, and I have cared for them, and I've taken care of them. They are down there worshiping a cow. And I'm done with them, and I'm taking them out. You know what? God is all wisdom, and God, is all, God has all knowledge. And I probably you can discern from that the best course of action would be to take them out. I mean, probably that would have been the easier, the better thing for God to do. God said, Moses, I'm going to start my nation, the nation I'm going to bless. I'm going to start it through you alone. I'm done with these people. I'm starting it through you. You know what Moses did? He built a case. He said, God, please don't. God, don't. Don't do it. And he built a case. God, I want you to do it because of this, and God, it's because of this, and God, it's because of this. And God, the scripture says, and God changed his mind. Now, some people read that and say, wow, God was having a tantrum. Why was it? And, then, and Moses talked about it. But no, God was probably going to take the best course of action to accomplish what he wanted. But Moses talked him out of it. That's amazing. And Hezekiah was a really neat king. Read, read in Isaiah about the king Hezekiah. He was a neat guy. A guy who pleased God with his actions. He didn't rebel against God. He was a neat guy. But Hezekiah got sick. We all get sick sometimes. He got really sick. In fact, God sent a, a prophet to tell Hezekiah, listen, this sickness you have, you're going to die. I want to let you know ahead of time, you're not going to recover from this, Hezekiah. Which that would be nice if God let us know, by the way, listen, I know you want it, but you're not going to recover. Thank you, because then you can make your plans. I thought it was very kind of God to say this to Hezekiah. But interestingly enough, Hezekiah, um, he asked God. He asked God for 15 more years. God, I know you said, you already said it. But God, can I ask you for 15 more years of life? God granted it. That's going to be significant in just a minute. 15 more years of life. And Joshua... Joshua was in the middle of a battle with an army. And the battle was going on, and his army began to win, but the sun was going down. And when the sun went down, you had to quit battling, and then both armies could retool and start again the next day. And Joshua didn't want it to stop. It was starting to turn in his favor. So he prayed, God, would you stop the sun? Would you stop the sun in the sky? Really? And according to Scripture, the sun stopped, which means the moon had to stop too, because they kind of worked together. And, and for 24 hours, the battle went on in the sunlight. You can change the plans, the design, the mind of God with your prayers. James Dobson's grandfather. I'm going to tell you about him in just a second. Natalie, where are you at? My, my kind. Come here, honey. If you would, please come here. You do not boss your woman around like that. It's a big mistake. I ain't coming up right here. Yeah. 
I asked her to tell a story because uh, this, uh, this is one of those things that uh, I'll never forget and neither will she. Um, Rick asked me to come up and share this real quick and I'm going to kind of do like two minutes here, uh, go backwards a little bit. Um, many, many years ago before we had kids, um, we went on a sailing trip uh, on the out islands of the Bahamas with Paul Billington and Rick. And as we're stocking up the boat, you know, you have your food, your water, your emergency supplies and everything. Um, I purposely only brought the Bible, you know, and I was, I was young and I only brought the Bible, I know, because I thought if I get bored, I'm going to have to read the Bible, you know, so it was kind of, you know, pre-planned. So wouldn't you know, we hit a storm, a storm was coming, and we anchor out uh, in a harbor for two whole days with no TV, no nothing, no nothing, no nothing, except for the Bible. <laughs> and so during those two whole days, because I do enjoy reading, I read like the entire uh, Old Testament. But I fell in love with it, and I came across the scripture that Rick shared, um, and it's actually in two different places I just discovered this morning, which is really cool. In 2 Kings 20 and in Isaiah thir uh, 38, um, it mentions Hezekiah's illness, and I'll, re I'll read it again. It says, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, Push, put your house in order, because you are going to die, you will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Um, before Isaiah had left the middle court, court, the word of the Lord came to him, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord says, the God of your father David. I have heard your prayers, prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. And, of course, the, the other one in um, uh, Isaiah, you know, it, it does say that um, he asked for 15 more years. So when I was 23, my dad was 44. And he said that um, he was feeling really, really sick. And, and there's a whole lot that went into saving his life, even like 30 years back. And I, that's a whole nother story, but I'm going to stay focused here. Um, he uh, ended up going to the doctors um, and found out he had like 100% blockage, you know, on one artery and 90% blockage in another. And his father had died of a massive heart attack at 49 when my dad was 16. His sister died at 49 of a massive heart, heart attack at, you know, 49 years old. And so this is a strong family history. So um, he, he got very sick, and he had bypass surgery. And, um, you know, I remembered that scripture, and I, I just, you know, I was very close to my dad as my sister and I were. And, you know, I just prayed and prayed, and I said, God, would you please give him 15 more years? And then, you know, I was specific, 15 more years. And at that time, I didn't have uh, my kids, uh, my baby sister didn't have her daughter and five years later my dad had another bypass ten years later his kidneys failed and and all in all he he died fifteen years later so god really granted him that but you know a lot a lot can happen in fifteen years he lived to see all five of his grandchildren you know additional grandchildren being born he lived to know them and you know it's just a testimony that you know it, not always are our prayers answered in the way that we want. Sometimes, you know, sometimes our loved ones do pass away before we want them to go. And certainly even at 15 years, I didn't want my dad to go. But it's just Rick asked me to share that. And I've, I've never forgotten this scripture because it was near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Natalie. I mentioned a minute ago a guy named James Dobson. If you don't know who that is, James Dobson is, is a pretty profound figure in America. He founded Focus on the Family. He's written many books about how to raise a family right and biblically you know, based. And he's, he's just a, a talk show speaker, incredible guy, a humble man. But God's used him in many, many ways. He tells a story. I was, I was driving around in my car. I don't remember if I was in my late 20s or early 30s. I'm not sure if Nate had been born yet or not. But it was early into us having children. It was it, no, no longer somewhere around. Nate's birth, I remember listening to the radio and James Dobson told a story and here was a story. He said his grandfather had a job and every day on his job he decided to take a part of his time of his, of his lunch hour out and pray. And he prayed for very specific things. One of the things that he prayed for consistently 
repeatedly, persistently. He prayed that all of his children would, would love God and serve God. And then he prayed that all of his grandchildren would love God and serve God. Now that's pretty specific prayer. Because you have a family, you always have a black sheep. I could have easily been one of them, you know. You, oh, it's just, you get a family, you have kids, lots of grandkids, and come on. So he prayed that all his kids and all his grandkids would serve God. James Dobson goes on to tell the story. He says, I just need you to know that my grandfather prayed that every day for years. I don't know how many years, but years. And he said, I need you to know that all of my aunts and uncles, all of my grandparents, uh, kids, all of them were either pastors or pastor's wives. And he said, I need you to know that all of my siblings and all of my aunts and uncles are either pastors or pastor's wives. He says, I'm the only black sheep of the family. I'm not a pastor or a pastor's wife. I just have this talk show. This talk show that's affect millions of lives for the, the sake of Christ. So I heard that story and it moved me. I thought, man, wow. I mean, you can't orchestrate that. Life is too unsure. You can't orchestrate 20, 30, 40 years in the future what's going to happen to your grandkids. You can't do it. But I started praying consistently. Not every day, sometimes maybe not even every week, but it was a repeated prayer. I started praying in my late 20s that all my children would serve God and all their children would serve God. Now their children's children is up to them to pray for. But I prayed for my children and my grandchildren. And I started praying in my late 20s. And I need to tell you, I've watched God intervene. I've watched God move me to start praying for my children and go kneeling by their bed and praying for them when they were little. My wife thought I should do it. I thought, oh, come on, honey. I, they're going to wonder, why is dad coming in here again? It became one of the sweetest times of our family's lives, praying for my children at night. How did God orchestrate my children? My oldest son will speak here next week. We split teaching. My second son, Canaan, led worship here today. My third son, Elijah, is in Dallas, Texas, preparing to serve God with his life. Now, I don't care if they're in the ministry or out of the ministry or if they're a broker or a banker or a garbage man, as long as they're well-kept garbage men. But I don't care what they do. I just want them to love God and serve God with what they do. My daughter, Allie, is going to go to YWAM, which is going to be in Colorado, to prepare to live her life for God in May. How does this happen? Because we're great people? Guess what? We're not. At least I'm not. I'm Rick. I was raised in Salerno with fish and criminals. <laughs> and I had a good start. Some good criminal mentors I had. <laughs> and I was well into my life of crime when at 16 years of age God got a hold of my heart. And I still had trouble telling the truth for many years after I became a Christian. My dad once said to me, he goes, you know, you will tell the truth, you will tell a lie when the truth makes better sense. And I thought, that's not true. I always think this through. I lie because it made sense to me. <laughs> I look at what God has done, what he does. In James, the book of James, chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. You'll like this. It says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You say, yeah, but really, I'm not, <laughs> not always righteous. I'm righteous now. I'm in church, but I may not be this afternoon because I'm going to go into Martin County traffic. I may not be when I get home. I may not be when I watch, a, a, watch the Dolphins maybe lose. I, I, I don't know that I'll be righteous. Listen, I like what it says. This, that was verse 16. Then it says in verse 17, it says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Verse 17, Elijah was just like us. He's going to say, by the way, let me just qualify this. Elijah, most translations actually render that. They say uh, he had a nature like ours, which is to say he did what we do. This is Elijah. Do you know the story of Elijah? I can't tell it. I don't have time, but I'll tell you this. He believed God so powerfully that he actually called fire down from heaven to burn up an altar and all these false prophets on the altar. And just a little while later, he's running for his life run away because a woman named Jezebel threatened his life. She's going to kill me. This is a guy who called fire down from heaven to burn. And it, oh no, this is Elijah. This is the guy. And I love this right here because it says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. But Elijah was just like us. However, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Prayer is powerful. It's not about you. It's about God. Prayer is powerful. It can change God's mind. It can change the present. It can change the future. It can change you. 
But before we're done with this question, before we're done with this today, we have to answer a question. And here's the question. And I know many of you would say, yes, we need to answer this. Why do prayers sometimes go unanswered? How many of you have ever prayed a prayer that didn't get answered? Can I see your hand? Really? This is it. This is it. This is it. I need to meet with the rest of you, find out what your secret is. <laughs> Why do prayers sometimes go unanswered? Some of you have the, you all, and immediately you, you, you know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, there was this guy named the Apostle Paul. Incredibly righteous guy. Bad guy, until God got a hold of him. Then an incredibly righteous guy who served God with passion. Endured all kind of hardship for the sake of Christ. Paul describes a thing in the 12th chapter of Corinthians. He called it his thorn in the flesh. It was something that really hurt him, bothered him, irritated him. I mean, it was more than a small irritation. He had endured hardship and shipwreck and beatings and bruising and being in jail. Whatever this was, was huge. Because he had asked God three times to take it away. God, would you please take it? And God did not take it away. Why? Paul, I love it. Paul came to an understanding there was a reason for it. Why not? God would take it away. There had to be a reason for it. And Paul's assumption, his conclusion was this. Paul had seen so many incredibly powerful things. He had seen stuff that no human had ever seen. He had had experiences out of the body with God. He could easily become puffed up and proud of all he had seen and all he had done. So God, he says, God sent me this thorn in the flesh to keep me humble. He uses the word, from, keep me from being conceited, swelled head. God allowed this to be in my life so that I would be humble because Paul knew himself. I love that. Reason number one, sometimes our prayers are not answered because God wants to accomplish something, something that can only be accomplished by allowing the thing we want gone to stay. Did you get that? Sometimes God allows it to stay even though we're praying for it to be gone because he has a purpose for it that cannot be accomplished if our prayers are answered. But we want it gone. We pray for it to be gone or changed or healed. And sometimes God leaves it or doesn't fix it or doesn't heal it because it accomplishes his will. An example is uh, sometimes a person's death causes many people to turn to God. Did you know that? I, I read the story of a pastor, a famous pastor one time who, who uh, he taught a lot of people, he was a humble man, and he had a list of people that he prayed for. And he, and he prayed that God would bring them to, 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 to a relationship with, with God through Christ, and he prayed for them. All of them had come to Christ except for one, and at his funeral, the guy's funeral, this one person came to Christ. All of his prayers had been answered for the people. But it was his death. The death of people, of humans, often sweet, innocent, loving people, draws many to their knees. 9-11 was a horrible event. Horrible. But it was the first time in my lifetime I had seen an entire nation turn to God. An entire nation. It was amazing. It was horrible. But it caused many people to turn to God and to come to know Christ. Reason number two, James 4, verse 3 says, you, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend them on your pleasures. Sometimes our prayers are not answered because we ignore God. We ignore God and His Word. We live our lives and make our own decisions with complete disregard to God. We live selfish and destructive lives that end us up in bad places with bad consequences. And then we pray prayers into the air hoping that God, if there is one, will fix it. What's amazing, here's what's amazing. Sometimes God actually comes and answers even those prayers. Even the prayers of someone who's snubbed their nose at God and lived their life their own way. Sometimes God will even come and answer those prayers because God knows the heart of a person we do not. Here's another example in Mark 11, verse 25 and 26. Jesus is speaking and he's teaching. Listen to what he says. He's talking about prayer here. He says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so your Father in heaven will also forgive your sins. Whoa. 
You're standing and you're praying. He's saying, stop in your tracks. Are you holding a grudge, unforgiveness, bitterness towards anyone? Yeah, but you know what? They deserve it. You don't know what they did. Any offense, anyone, forgive. Or your heavenly Father who's in heaven. That's what it says next. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your sins. Oops. We missed that one a lot. Come on. I'm telling you, God will answer the prayers of a foolish person because I had so many prayers answered as a foolish person but I kept working at trying to figure trying to lift, line my life up with God's word it meant a lot of apologizing for me a lot of repenting for me a lot of mistakes oh my goodness let's write a book on mistakes and sins and bad habits and, but I'm telling you God will answer the prayer of a person who persists in prayer The point here is this. We can't live our lives opposite of God's design for us. We talk about God's design for us all the time here. God designed you this way. And when you live this way, out of God's design, you cannot expect to have a good life because God designed you this way. We can't live our lives opposite of God's design, opposite of God's will for us, opposite of God's instruction to us, and expect to get our prayers answered. So to review before we close this message up. Sometimes our prayers are not answered because God has a reason, a purpose. Little girl named Phoebe was sick. Little, how old was that child? Anybody remember? Three years old. Beautiful little child. Had leukemia, I think. And tens of thousands of people, I guess probably hundreds of thousands, all over the world praying for Phoebe. And she would get a little better and we would rejoice and be excited. And then one day Phoebe just got weak and passed away. And we go, why? We don't know why. We'll never know why. God knows why. And I will tell you this, when you read the letter that her parents put out just a month later, you can only stand back and say, there's the power of God to comfort the heart of people who, who would seem to have no reason to be comforted. You know what happens when, when a person loses a loved one and they lose touch with life and hope and joy. The rest of their children suffer. Their spouse suffers if they have one. Their, their lives suffer because they can't get beyond it. And God is able to lift us up in a way that we can't lift ourselves up. Somebody is unkind to you at school. They're mean to you and they hurt you. And it breaks your heart. And you go, why did this happen, God? Why? And listen, if you'll take that burden, that heartache, that hurt to God, he will make it, he will, he will lift you up above it. So you can forgive the person and grow out of it. Grow into a person like you could never imagine yourself being. The power of prayer. But you must forgive. The power of prayer. Did you know Jesus himself taught the importance of prayer? Jesus sometimes just drilled down and focused on it. He said, I want you to pray. And here's how, here's how you pray. There was a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray. He described it. Jesus wanted us to pray. Paul the Apostle wanted us to pray throughout the Scripture. Old Testament and New were encouraged to pray. Why? Why did James Dobson take hours of his radio show to to focus on prayer? Why am I passionately talking about it today? Why did Natalie come up here? Why would many of you run up here and grab that mic and tell your story if you could? Because you know it works. You know it's the beginning of a relationship with God. It's that first tool that you have that would enable you to drive the nail of hope and relationship into your life. It works. It's true. When you pray, you unleash the power of God in your life. This is, I love this. When you pray, you unleash the power of God and your life. And God begins to shape and orchestrate your future as he heals you from your past. Dang. That's what prayer does. Don't let anything keep you from praying. Ramp up your prayers. As we give an invita- if we, as we call people down for prayer today, I, I am asking any of you who want you to come kneel down at this altar and pray and make a commitment to, to up your prayer, to spend time alone with God, to up your relationship with God. 
I can't tell you the times I walked down an aisle and knelt down and said, God, please don't let me live my life my way because I'm not good at it. God, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. And he did. Passionate expressions of commitment matter because it drives it into your soul. I'm serious about this. I invite you, as the band comes up here and plays a song, I invite anybody who has a prayer need to come down here. We'll have somebody at Cinder will be over here, and I'm going to ask somebody else to come over here because Tom's gone today. Uh, you guys want to come pray, Rick and Robin, that would be awesome unless your foot hurts, Robin. <laughs> come down here, and we're going to have people up here to pray. If you would stand right now and listen as you stand, go ahead and stand up. We pray for needs, and often these prayers are answered. Sometimes they're not. Often they are. We invite you to come down and we'll pray for you. If you just want to come down here and kneel down somewhere and make a cup God, I want everyone to know I'm going to commit myself to deeper prayer. I don't care what people think about me. God, I care what you think about me. I'm going to say a prayer for you real quick and then we're going to, these guys will begin to play. Father in heaven, we come before you now. We ask you for help. Help for everybody in this room, God, who will listen, everyone who will humble themselves and ask you for help. Five years old, 15 years old, 25, 60, 80, however old we are in this room, we ask you for help. Not just to cope, not just to keep our heads above water, but to walk in peace and joy and hope. I pray that for everyone in this room, that we would seek you first, so we, so we become blessable by you. I pray this in Jesus' incredible name. Amen.